feel love, I feel safe, I feel Jesus, yeah, in this place, I feel the warmth within me, oh, I can't describe it, no, 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 but I to share a Lonnie story. And um, a lot of you know that I uh, was asked by Lonnie to, to write his testimony. And we did it in a, a book. And I was trying to think of something. He said, just some Lonnie story. And I'm thinking, oh. you know, the first book was all about the Jesus movement. That's a full book. So what do I pick out of that? The second book was about a uh, denomination was birthed out of the Jesus movement. And then the second book is about Lonnie's life story was called The Great Commission where he went around the world and started revivals in, uh, around the world, England, South Africa, primarily uh, Brazil. And then another came back to the States and blew up uh, Calvary Chapel, Yoba Linda, which John Wimber was pastoring that church in uh, 1980. And <clears throat> that birth where King Gullickson turned the, the vineyard over to John Wimber because of Lonnie caused so much. Uh, a lot of people thought it was God. A lot of people thought it was the devil because people, you know, Lonnie said, come Holy Spirit. He, first of all, he called um, about 400 kids, 25 and under, to come forward. And then he said these three words, come Holy Spirit. And uh, it's either Holy Spirit, come, or come Holy Spirit. <laughs> Because they got it wrong. Doesn't matter. He wanted the Holy Spirit to come. When he said that, all the people fell on the floor, all these kids, and uh, totally blew up the church. John Wimber was freaking out. And um, because he, you know, he didn't know what was happening. 
And these kids were uh, speaking in tongues. Some of them were getting healed. Some of them were out on the floor for a long, long time. So that's a long story. That's in book number one. I mean, that's, yeah, that's in book number two, I'm sorry. And, um, and of course, that birthed another denomination, the Vineyard Christian Fellowship. So this little guy, a little hippie, um, he started to, he was a catalyst that started two, two uh, worldwide denominations. So the third book, and because I knew that nothing very short could happen in those first two stories, their whole book. And then um, the third book is kind of about Lonnie's brokenness. How could God use, and that's what I'm going to try to make a real short story out of that. Um, but Lonnie was molested when he was eight years old by a babysitter. And uh, he didn't realize that how that ongoing molestation was going to affect him throughout his life. And it's like, and then of course the devil sees somebody that has an anointing on their life. And don't you think that he would do everything in his power to bring that person down and ruin his testimony or whatever? And he was pretty successful, you know, because Lonnie, um, uh, but the story that I wanted to tell that I'm involved in kind of with Lonnie was kind of a father story and a bitterness story because um, Lonnie's real dad was a, 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 a half Indian, honky-tonk singer, alcoholic, really wild guy. His name's Ray Frisbee. That was his natural father. And then... What happened was when he was three years old, he didn't ever acknowledge Lonnie as his son. So he drug him to the courthouse to, um, against his mother's will, while he's having an affair with this other woman, by the way. And he drug him up there to have a blood test to prove, yeah, water. That's why I hesitate public speaking, you know, because, all right, so. And if, if this hand shakes, it's not nervousness. It's, I'm 73, and it's starting to get to me. So, see? See what I mean? So this left hand. So anyways, uh, Lonnie, um, they got in a tug of, war, tug of war between the mother and the father. Lonnie, was, she was trying to take him away. He was trying to drag him in the, into the courthouse. And finally, they broke free, and he grabbed Lonnie and threw him in the car. Lonnie was three years old stood up on the front seat and, and he was crying and then Ray punched him in the head. And he said he wet his pants. And that's the last thing he remembers of his real dad. And he held on to bitterness against Ray for, it, it poisoned him. I mean, uh, as well as being molested. Okay, and then his stepdad raised him in total rejection. So that's a long story. So you have to read book one and two to get the whole story. <laughs> So book three is about how Lonnie um, uh, was dealing with, because allegations came out that, uh, uh, that he was gay, allegations came, allegations came out that he did this, that, and the other, that he was using drugs, and he really wasn't doing any of those things. He had had some those experiences during high school uh, and everything, but the whole time in the Jesus movement and the whole time in his missionary career, he, he was never for homosexuality. He never approved it. He knew it was unbiblical. But um, when his uh, Calvary Chapel, his spiritual father, so we got father issues, right? Ray, and then his stepdad, Lyle, and then Chuck Smith was his spiritual father for the first part, for book one. Book two, John Wimber was his spiritual father. And when they had problems, one of them stabbed him in the back, the other one kind of just rejected him. So all the father figures in his life kind of uh, really caused some severe damage to this guy's emotions and his life. So uh, when, uh, book three goes through that. And right now, uh, God made me put his life story on hold for 14 years. And I didn't finish all three of the Lonnie books for 29 years. And so really this time in our life here is uh, sexual brokenness is uh, such a big deal in so many people's lives. And uh, so it kind of affected, uh, well, you know, I was part of the sexual re revolution, hippie, rebel, 
And the last thing I thought I'd be, I was a drug dealer, would be a Christian. Because you know, as my cousin's here, first time we've been together in 50 some years, and um, my uncle, my, an my uncle just died, and that's the reason uh, we got in touch with each other. And then my brother died, Vietnam vet, and I had, uh, um, anyway, he Zoomed, we Zoomed talked at the funeral, but um, that's about the contact that I had with him. It's time for the left arm. So, <laughs> so anyways, uh, I, was, I just want to mention that I thought I had a lot of guts. I surfed waves, got surfers here that my level of experience, I was insane to even attempt them. But I had the guts to do that. I got in lots of fights. I, I, I was an alcoholic too, pretty much. And, uh, you know, I felt instead of five foot seven, I felt like I was as tall as Chris Reed, you know, six foot seven. But uh, I had good luck in my fighting career until I met my Waterloo. And so anyways, none of, none of that, but where was I in this story? Okay. <laughs> we, got, we got some broken people, and I was one of them. And, of course, I met Christ. Uh, my cousin was asking me, well, exactly how did it happen? Did it just happen in an instant? Or, I said, it's a long story. I wrote three books about Lonnie, and I'm working on the fourth one. And it, so that's a long story. And I wrote one book around me, one book about me, but it's 538 pages long. So it's a long story. But, but God got to me. And he's got to probably almost everybody here in one way or the other. But the thing that I wanted to say about, to finish my Lonnie story and turn this over to, to a very anointed preacher, half my age, and uh, who used to be afraid of public speaking, and now he's doing an awesome job. But um, um, where am I at in this? Um, um, okay, Lord, let me say a little prayer. Last time I reached this point, I bailed, okay? And I'm not going to bail because, because it's, I think it's important to all of us, really. So, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you, uh, uh, I'm getting like my mom. She, for, she, she says one thing and they ask me five minutes later what did, the same question. But, Lord, I'm praying in the name of Jesus that you would help me to tie this together here, a little Lonnie story that would bless these people. Dear God, bless my cousin, Lord, and bless anybody that's on live stream or whatever. And so I just ask God you'd help me to do that. So, uh, Holy Spirit, I felt you so strong in the worship tonight. A couple of those songs made me cry, and, and I'm not really a crier. You know, my wife didn't see me cry for 30-some years, you know, until my daughter went to college back in New York. That got to me. But anyways, Lord, um, tonight I feel something special going on here, and I want to finish this story and then turn this over to a great sermon that, that Daniel's going to preach. And more worship, too, a little bit at the end, because I like that. But um, so, Lord, um, all right. In the name of Jesus, I want to tie it together because um, license plate? No. Uh, uh, I should have made notes. You know, Bob's got the idea. You know, you just... You were talking about all his rejections. Yes. Okay. See, there's sympathy out there for me. There's, there's crowd participation. Um, yeah, people are listening. So I'm feeling sorry for me. Um, so, uh, um, I guess the bottom line is, is that Lonnie, he got healed up, and uh, when I first met him, he was going on a mission trip, and uh, I got a phone call from the pastor that led me to Christ, and he said, I hear you're working with Lonnie Frisbee, and uh, I said, yeah, I said, you know, I've only been working with him for about a, less than a month, and he said, well, I'm ministering to this young man who says he's, Ray, he's Lonnie's brother. He's Ray's Frisbee's son. And, he wants, and Ray wants to meet you. So Lonnie Frisbee's father that he hated, that he had this root of bitterness towards, that beat him when he was three years old, um, wanted to meet with me. And I had already, because of how I came to Christ, I was convinced that I was having supernatural things happen. And that's what led me to Christ. No preacher did, you know, it's just these events that led me to a preacher who introduced me to the Lord's Prayer. I mean, not the Lord's Prayer, salvation prayer. And I, you know, was ready. But so anyways, I, here I, so I met with Ray. And he basically wanted to 
meet with his son. And I said, well, he's in Brazil right now. But when he gets back, uh, you know, uh, I'll see if we, I'll tell him, you know, maybe we can do it. So when he got back, he, he would not meet with Ray. Lonnie was so bitter against Ray Frisbee and the things he did to his mother. Pretend it's wine, you know. So. <laughs> Get me high. So, so, uh, cause I, I used to be so inhibited, but when I'd get drunk, it came out, it came out. I, I mean, I had a bunch of people in, in, a, in Big Bear, California, that I, when I was so drunk that I, I, they started a little concert and everything, and I led all these guys at the pool table to Christ, soldiers, you know. I was just, uh, and I did that a couple times, but the Lord told me, this is not something that you want to keep going. You know. All right, so, but, uh, so anyways, Lonnie would not meet with Ray, and I, I went and told him, I said, I'm sorry, Ray, but Lonnie just is not ready. Uh, he's got some issues with you, and he says, well, I understand, so blah, blah, blah. So, so then fast forward about a year. In the meantime, I developed a relationship with Ray, and I think that I led this guy to Christ. He didn't drop on his knees and all that, but um, I gave him a supernatural word that God told me on the freeway. And, uh, and he said, well, and I said, and you're going to get saved, and it's going to happen in this time period. Okay, and he said, it might happen, might happen. I mean, he would never even consider it. This guy was the real de deal, hardcore not Christian. I mean, he had, he had on his knuckles a four-letter word. That's, one of them says, starts with an F, and the other one, Y-O-U. So, you know, you bump, boom, you know. And so, so that's, that was Ray's dad, I mean, Lonnie's dad, Ray. But I think that he's in heaven. He's dead now. Like almost all my friends, you know, or a lot of them. But, um, except for these guys. Yeah. So... Anyways, um, so, so we went fishing in, in Irvine Lake, Lonnie and me, and her, his brother, Stanley, is like a world-class fisherman. I mean, this guy's really, really good, Stanley. And, and uh, so we go and uh, caught a bunch of fish. I filmed it. I filmed everything. Because since I was seven years old, I knew I was supposed to uh, uh, write a book, and I knew that I was supposed to do film. So I got some of the oldest cameras in the world. Not really, but very old cameras, eight millimeter, you know, just black and white, no sound. And um, so I got really close with Lonnie over the last three years. And so we're driving down the free, but I knew it. he was, this guy loved every microphone in the world. He just loved the spotlight. He was opposite of me and anointed. You know, Lonnie said, you can be the best preacher in the world, but if you're not anointed, you're just wasting everybody's time plus your own. So, um, so anyways, we're really good friends, and at one point, back to the original story here um, of rejection and things, I told, while we were fishing, Lonnie said he, he was being restored. You know, the third book is about restoration, how God got him in touch with his brokenness. It's, it was all very supernatural, but was, he got hooked on, he backslid, he started doing what everybody was accusing him of. He fell moral, failed morally, went on a four-year cocaine binge. You know, he just, he went down in San Diego to the pit. And uh, then when he got to the pit, uh, read the story in chapter 10. Some people, I had to calm it down because people couldn't get any farther because he was so transparent. But a guy broke in uh, and, uh, and, and robbed him and molested him, tied him up, and uh, hog-tied him. You know, it's, it's really horrible. And then after, and he called the cops finally after he got free and uh, so on. But so Lonnie was, he finally started to get some help. And so I met him when he was way into the, I mean, I worked with him. I met him the first time when he prayed for me at uh, Canyon High School on the Mother's Day period. But 10 years later, this happened, with, where he was kicked out of the vineyard because of allegations and stuff. So anyways, to finish this story up, I hope, the, um, uh, I'm, I'm riding with Lonnie in a car, 
on the, 70, on the freeway in, in Orange County. And I told him, I said, Lonnie, uh, oh, I got to back up just one. In the boat, Lonnie was being healed up. He's back in church. He was getting counseling. Rich Bueller, a famous broadcast guy, he had recommended Lonnie get some counseling and this, that, and the other. And, and so he was. He was on a program. So God used the counseling, and he used Phil Aguilar, who's my friend that's spoken in this church several times. Uh, his church set free with thousands of people. They embraced Lonnie. And so that was part of his healing. And then friends. I was one of his friends, and other his friends and his brother. We all loved on this guy. And he started getting healed up. So I felt pretty close, like maybe I could speak into his life a little bit as a friend. And, uh, and I said, you know, Lonnie, in, in the boat, while we're fishing, he said, this time I'm back with the Lord. I'm, we're going to go up, up, up. I'm not going to mess up. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do whatever he wants. I don't care what he wants. I'm going to do it. And he said, we're going to go up, 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 up to the, to the tippy top. You know, and so I, I thought, great. You know, I felt like I was a part of that. So a little later, we're driving in the car months later, but he would never even see Ray. And he still had this root of bitterness against John Wimber and against the father figures, all the father figures in his life. Lonnie could not forgive them, you know? And so I told him in the car, I said, I said, Lonnie, um, I think the Lord showed me that you're never going to get to the tippy, tippy top until you forgive Ray. And I mean, uh, if anybody knows Lonnie, he's got a temper and he's got words that can cut you down like, you know, like Zorro. You know, um, he said, that's so elementary, you know, and he goes, he read the riot act to me while I'm driving. And I felt about this tall. And uh, so we, I took him home to his apartment. And Dennis Evans was his roommate, ministry partner for years. He's about six foot four and weighs about 250 pounds. And he didn't really like me. He was kind of like I was the new kid on the block in Lonnie's little entourage of because he was a famous guy. And so, so we walk into the apartment and, and um, Lonnie tells Dennis. He said, hey, Dennis, on the way over here, uh, Roger's... Uh, reading into my life or he's uh, speaking into my life telling me this and telling me that and then so Dennis jumps on the bandwagon and so now Lonnie's beating me up with his words telling me this is none of your business and then he said yeah your your job here is not to speak anything into Lonnie's life and blah 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 he joined in and and so I was feeling you know I mean I, you know, I was in fighting mode I'm not going to fight these guys but I, I didn't I just shut up didn't do anything and then Lonnie walks up to me, and he points his finger in my face about right in my, it got up in my face, and he says, I can read you, I can read you from the top, tippy top of your head to the, to your, to your toes. And he goes, you know, and I thought he was going to give me some more, right? And so then he goes, he says, you just want to, and he paused, you just want to bless and help as many people as you possibly can. Uh, and I'm going, it's like Twilight Zone, that music, <laughs> you know. And it was, the Lord stepped in and kicked in his anointing, and he spoke, and that was the truth. I was, I was only there to help him. And I, that's the, this is the end of the story. I'm only here to help as many people as I can. Lonnie read my mail. I, was, I am so grateful that God reached into my stupid life and pulled me out of, you know, I mean, I had Mexicans, Mexican mafia guys. I had 120 kilos that I lost in, in Tijuana. And then we got two more late, on credit, right, to these guys. And so I had all that against me. And, and God delivered me out of all that, and I'm still not dead. And, um, and, we're, and we're right here at the end of possibly the end of an age. And... Um, so this book four is kind of about how God, uh, see, this is all promotion of book one, two, three. <laughs> but it's, it's, I'm just telling you that we need to get saved. And I do believe the whole Bible 
And uh, I do believe that this is the end of an age period. I don't, you know, for a while I thought I was going to maybe not pay, make it past the election. But there's one guy I think that can extend it a little bit. Give us time to bring in a revival, you know. And it's, it's the one that loves babies, okay? Unborn babies, too. So anyway, that's my political speech. And um, I just, I do want to help as many people as Ken, and uh, this chapel has been a big blessing, and we're going to keep doing this and other things, Lord willing. So God bless you. So, wow, that was good. Thank you. It's cool to really hear, like, yeah, just hear generations and hear fathers share, and you get to really receive from that and how God doesn't choose the perfect people you know people that have a past people that have been there and and you know he didn't come for the perfect people he came for those who need mercy that need grace and people that recognize that um but yeah last week i was helping out with dana's surf camp if anyone was there it was pretty fun and there was a story i wanted to share about that um we took out this big raft on the waves and there was about four adults and about three or four kids with us and the waves during this time have not been the smallest so they've been probably five to six an occasional seven foot you know wave coming through and these kids you know so god bless them thank you for their protection because they're all alive still (laughs) um but we took out this big raft and dan you know hey we're gonna go for it we're going all the way out, and I kind of kept reminding him, hey, let's, about halfway, we're good. We'll take the wave in halfway, because I'm looking at this little kid in front of me, and just like these waves are like, they're getting bigger. I'm like, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, we're way out there, and then all of a sudden, it's dead silent. Like There's no waves, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, there's a big swell coming. I just feel it. When it's dead silent like that, something big's about to crash through. And so we see this, these big waves roll through, probably six or seven, which is a big wave for a raft with seven people on it, for a raft. Like, we're not on a surfboard, we're on a big raft. And we try to get the first wave and we miss it, but that pulls us kind of back into the shore more. So then we try to get the second wave and we're too far ahead of it. And so it literally we, like, picks us up and then we start doing this. And I was, like, Addie was saying, yeah, we're catching the wave, we're catching the wave, and going straight in the water. Um, but it was pretty gnarly. Like, I'm just thinking, like, I was okay for my, I was a little scared. You know, I'm not like a rookie in the water. And I was making sure all the kids were okay, and, you know, they grabbed us, and we made it safe. But all of a sudden, we see these, like, all the moms, like, paddle out in the, the surfboard. <laughs> what the heck? You know? <laughs> so... It's good to see the Lord's protection in the water. The Lord's. So I was mentioning, hey, maybe next time let's give them like some life jackets just in case. You never know. Um, yeah, it's fun. But on another note, that's not has nothing to do with the sermon. I just want to share that story. Um, last Sunday... I went to the Shelby's Deli and I wanted to get just a snack, so like some chips. And then I went into the little area where they make all the cakes. And a lot of times that's when the Lord does, I don't know why, I hear God's voice a lot when there's food. And so I'm going to go get a kombucha. And then right then, um, I felt like someone had a migraine on the right side of their eye. So like right there, and it was very clear. And so there was four people working there, and I felt like it was one of the four, one of the co-workers. And so I was like, I don't know who it is. Like, if this is a church setting, we, you take the mic, hey, who has pain on the right, you know? But we're in a deli, you can't really do that. And so realizing, like, during these moments to learn to be still and actually slow down. I think our culture today is, like, really fast and now, but learning to be still, to recognize the still small voice. So learning to tone it down, I'm just gonna rest and just be still. And so then I said, hey, what's your favorite like cake here? Just kind of small talk. Hey, that looks like a really nice carrot cake. Just small talk. 
If you don't know what to do, just be normal and have a normal conversation. <laughs> like, hey, that's what's your favorite food? Or, man, you know. But out of that normal conversation, then it was highlighted really clearly it was the blonde girl that, that had the migraine headache. And so I said, hey, do you have um, a migraine right now on the right side of your head? And all of the coworkers like stopped because they knew that was her. And she goes, how did you know that? And I said, Jesus just showed that to me. And she's like, no, really, how? And I said, Jesus, like Jesus. She didn't know Jesus. And she's like, whoa, like what else did he have to say? You know, and so just saying Jesus loves you, he wants to have a relationship with you. And we just prayed for her right there on the spot. And, you know, some people say, well, what's the point of a little word knowledge for for a headache? Well, that could be the key to someone's salvation. A simple word of like, hey, you have a migraine headache could be like, oh, my gosh, God sees me. God knows me. And so recognizing that, like, I, that's why I love Holy Spirit, because he, lo- he knows the details of every person. And we can simply just like not even be looking for a word. I was going there to get chips and then God pursues us. And I just got to keep hanging out around like restaurants and like delis. <laughs> it's, I'm serious. Though. I was just thinking like all these like divine appointments happen around food. So anyways, um, but I think a lot of times we don't want to step out of the boat because like we're afraid of what people are going to think. Like our reputation, what are they going to think if I get it wrong? But Luke 9.24, it says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. If we try to hold on to my reputation, what people think of me, it says we'll lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so we need to lay down what people think of us if we get it wrong and just be like, God, I'm not going to concern myself with that anymore. I'm going to lay that down and be free from the opinion of others. Um, And so I wanted to really share tonight on the parable of the talents. I think a lot of times we can ask God, I want more gifting. I want more talents. I want this. But like, what does God say about actually the talents that we're supposed to use today? And this is the question that God really answers is in this parable. What should we do with our lives right now until Jesus returns? So what should we be doing now? Jesus is always sharing stories and parables. Like he doesn't always tell it how it is. He actually says, here, here's a story about what you should do. And so I'm just going to start in Luke 19, if you guys have your Bible or whatever. And this is in verse 12. So Luke 19, verse 12. I'm just going to read till 27. I might skip a couple, but it says, Jesus said, a noble man was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together 10 of his servants and divided among them 10 pounds of silver, saying, invest this for me while I am gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not want him to be our king. After he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You're a good servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted you to, so you'll be governor of ten cities as your reward. And then the next thing with the five, he got five more, and then he was governor of five cities. I'm just summarizing that part. Verse 20 says the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. So you're thinking you didn't waste the money. That sounds at least kind of faithful, like not wasting the money. Verse 21 says, I was afraid because I know you are a harsh man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. Verse 22, you wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a harsh man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. 
Then turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, Take the money from the servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who didn't want to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. And so that sounds like, wow, that's a pretty heavy you know, word right there. But the key here is like, this isn't their salva- based on their salvation. Like they're already saved, they're already going to heaven. This is simply being faithful with the talents that's been given to us. And so we need to see God as not just, yes, he's our father, yes, he's our friend, but also he's our master, we're his servant. And if we only see God as only our friend, then we're only going to do things according to our terms and if it's according to our conveniences. And God is our master, and at the end of my life, of all of our lives, we're going to come to him and be accountable for our life. Yes, we're saved by the blood of Jesus. Yes, we're going to be like God. Thank you for your forgiveness. The only way is by grace. But he's given everyone talents to use for his kingdom. You know, and this is not a place of like, oh, condemnation. This is a place of opportunity to actually really maximize what he's given us. Um, And the problem here was the, the unfaithful servant saw the master as really strict. So obviously that's the wrong mindset that we need to have of God that yes, we're his servant, but he's an abundant, generous master. Yes, he's a loving father and he's a friend, but also I'm going to be like, God, tell me what to do. Like I'm your servant. At the end, it was job well done, good and faithful servant. You're not just son or daughter, which is amazing, but like we are his servants. And, and I want to really utilize the gifts that he's given us. You know, and I can't compare myself with someone else. The person with five can't compare himself with a person with ten. And actually, if you compare yourself or try to be like them, you're actually going to squander what's been given to you. Um, But one of the key verses here is in verse 13 when it says, Do business until I return. That word, do business is the word pragma motaya. I I think I botched how to say it. But it means to busy oneself, to transact business or trade, exchanging to make a gain. The opposite of being fruitless by refusing to make trades by playing it safe. So he said, hey, do business by not playing it safe. So we have a gift in our life and we can be very safe and be very logical and kind of just really hide our talent or we could take mighty risks for the kingdom and that's the opposite of playing it safe. If you have a gift of healing or let's say a prophetic gift, playing it safe says, yeah, that probably was just me. I'm not going to share it. Oh, that was probably just me. I'm not going to share with anyone. Oh, that was a dream. Eh, that probably was, was just, that probably wasn't the Lord. You know, if we keep doubting God, then we're going to keep the talent hidden under the ground. And so God says, I want you guys to be bold and take mighty risks with your gifts. And obviously, don't be like stupid with it, but like step out of the boat with the gifts that's been given to you. And it's not just supernatural gifts. This is like a gift if you need, like literally this story is about making money. You know, so we always make it into like a supernatural, like, hey, what are your gifts of the spirit? That could be part of it, but it's also being faithful with money that's been given to us. And so one talent was worth 100 days wages. So he gave like a thousand days wages to one person. And so his faithfulness was not determined by how much he studied or read or even prayed. It was actually determined by how he multiplied the money. Does that make sense? I guess kind of, maybe a little bit. (laughs) This is, we're going to be okay. This is a good one. Um, (laughs) And I think a lot of times too, like the unfaithful servant, he was like, yeah, but I thought you were a harsh man. And we can't come up with excuses at the end of our life of saying, yeah, but this, yeah, but my pastor, yeah, but my spouse. Yeah, there's no excuses that are going to work. 
you know. And so God wants us to take full responsibility for the talents he's given us and that we would know that we know that we know what gifts we have. He doesn't want us to doubt and be like, yeah, I don't know which one it is. He wants us to have full confidence of the talents we have. And I think one thing that's really important too, it's better to master your gifts than just kind of be good at everything. Like actually master your talents and be amazing at it. And that's what God wants us to do. You know, it's better, like for example, let's say, and this is a rare gift you don't really see too often, like interpretation of tongues. If you someone mastered that and then taught the body of Christ how to interpret tongues, that would be a very useful talent to use. Um, but if everyone's just kind of good at everything, it's like, I doesn't, you can't go as deep in the Lord or really preaching to people. Um, and so Ephesians 2, verse 8, it says, By grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It's the gift of God. So we got that, you know. Not by works so no one can boast. So a lot of times we end there and say, Well, I don't want to do anything for God because I don't want to earn my salvation. So we end it there. But then right after it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we've already been given the full inheritance, but how do we steward what's already ours? How do we actually apply you know, what's ours now? Um, there was a story, this guy named Don Marwan was sharing, he went to heaven, he like died and went to heaven, and Jesus said, you haven't done anything for me. You know, it's kind of like, whoa, you know. <laughs> and so he gave him a new name, he called him Timothy II, I don't know why that, I don't know what that means. And he went back to earth and ended up preaching the gospel all over the world. And, you know, God, I love it because God gives us third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances. Moses he really wasn't used by God until he was 80. I don't think anyone's 80 or above here, you know. And so, like, if you feel like you wasted the first half of your life, God, like, he's more concerned how we finish than how we start, you know. And so realizing that, um, Ephesians 2, sorry, Ephesians 4, verse 7, it says, Each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So God's given grace. He's given gifts to every believer. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives away and gave gifts to men. So like it comes down to realizing what gift we have and just really maximizing that. Um, I think a lot of times, too, we can kind of be um, kind of uncertain of what gift we have. And we're like, what am I supposed to do? How do I find it out? And we have to look here and say, God, like we can ask him, but also what makes us come alive? What are we natural at? What do we love doing? You know, if, it's, if God's going to call you to go to Africa and be a missionary or build an orphanage, you're going to be somewhat passionate about it. I don't think you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I have to do this. You know, like, for example, like in for praying for healing, I love doing that. That is so fun. I could do that for hours. But not everyone probably likes to do that. If you have a teaching gift, you're going to love teaching. And not just in the church, like outside the church. And if you love to evangelize, it's, you're going you're gonna to come alive doing it. And so realizing the gifts that you have, you're going to love and be passionate about doing it. You're not always going to love it, you know. I thought I enjoyed coaching beach volleyball, but recently it's been the toughest time of my life for coaching. I told the like the overseer person, I said, "This is the most, <laughs> this is the most unathletic kids I've ever seen in my life." <laughs> now, I'm just being honest, so no one, you know, just I'm just being transparent right now. It's just frustrated, and so maybe I need to take a break from coaching beach volleyball for a little bit. <laughs> um. I don't know why I wasn't planning on sharing that. So, <laughs> frustration's coming out. Um, but a lot of people say, well, I had a gift when I was a kid, but then I made mistakes, and I don't think I have it anymore. That's actually false. 
Romans 11, 29, for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. So you have a gift on your life since birth. It's still there. You think you made mistakes to, to get rid of it? That's not possible. If it's by grace, it's going to stay by grace. So Kenneth Hagin, he had passed her for, fit, this is kind of a funny story, but he passed her for 15 to 20 years outside of God's will. He was never called to be a pastor, but a prophet and a teacher. He asked Jesus, why didn't you tell me before now that I was pastoring outside of your will for these many years? Why did you let me go on like this for this long? Jesus replied to him saying, because you never asked. This amazed me when I read the story because it showed me that Jesus will be silent about a lot of things that you're doing even when those things are good works, until you voluntarily ask him what his will is. This is how meek people are. They're very quiet about things and will not volunteer certain information until they are asked to do so. This is what you call gentleness. And so a lot of times, maybe we don't know our gifting or our purpose because we never asked Jesus what it is. So maybe we got to ask him right now or ask him tonight, like, God, what are my talents? What is my specific calling? You know, the key, too, is like, I want to stay in my lane. I want to stay in my assignment. I want to stay in my anointing my whole life. If I look at someone else and be like, yeah, I'm going to try to be like them, that's when we get out of our lane. I want to stay right on the prize specifically in my assignment. <clears throat> Got one more. I got a couple more, and then I've, I want to make some time for some ministry. Bill Johnson said many believers live with the concept that God will lead them when it's time for them to do something. So they wait sometimes for an entire lifetime without making any significant impact on the world around them. Their philosophy I have a red light until God gives me a green one, and the green light never comes. The Apostle Paul lived in the green light district of the gospel. He didn't need signs in the heavens to convince him to simply obey the scriptures. When Jesus said go, that was enough. He still needed the Holy Spirit to show him what was at the forefront of the Father's mind. But it's easier to steer a moving car than a parked one. So a lot of times we're thinking, well, I don't know what to do. We'll take the first step. If you have a teaching gift, maybe start discipling one person, and then God gives you another person, and then you have a Bible study. And so whatever that gift is, if you have an evangelism gift, so just start going to the streets. You know, if you have a healing, just start praying for headaches or whatever. Start praying for your family members. And so our responsibility, I'm going to obey God. God brings the increase. I think a lot of times, like, we want this increase and this promotion but God says, have you been faithful what's been given to you now? You know? I'm not trying to be too solemn here. I'm just trying to. <clears throat> so 2 Timothy 1 verse 6, it says, This reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. So a lot of times we don't even know what to do. We're just going to pray. The leaders can pray, and actually the gift of God can be really revealed what's been there the whole time. Um, I think a lot of times, too, maybe we're not fully surrendered to the Lord, and we're just not sure. And it says in Proverbs 25, 4, Take away the dross from the silver, and there comes out a vessel for the smith. Um, I was talking to my buddy Abram, and I was asking my buddy Chad, I said, hey, if, if you happen to be in Encinitas, can you pray for Abram? And he ended up praying. He was at this church called Beach Chapel, and I showed him a picture of Abram, and I said, okay, if you get a prophetic word, just share it. And Abram like calls me or texts me the next day, and he goes, hey, the craziest thing happened. Chad prophesied for like photography for me. And that's what I've been doing and pursuing. It's been a passion. But then five minutes later, this random person wrote me a check for $1,000 to buy a new camera. And I'm like, praise God. Um, feel free to give me some of that money. Because I, 
But sometimes we just simply need to ask. We need to simply ask the Lord, but ask people like, hey, do, can you, do you have a word for me? Or, hey, can you pray for me? I think a lot of times, like I was thinking, Chad, he gets all these crazy like gifts and things, but he's always asking a lot. Sometimes a little too much, but it's <laughs> like, uh, maybe no. Um, but I feel like as sons and daughters and servants, like to ask God, we need to ask him. We got to be bold with our requests and ask him big things, big requests, not just have like, can I get a scrap? I want to have a feast and to ask him daily, like knock on the door. If he already gave us his son, there's no too great of a request we could ever ask God. And so, like, let's be bold and keep knocking. Um, but one thing I wanted to pray tonight is that people's gifts and their talents would be realized. They would be known. They would be, there would be a confidence that every person here tonight that they would know that they know what their talents are. And this could be for the marketplace. This could be also for the gifts of the Spirit. Since we all have God living inside of us, I believe we have access to all the gifts of the Spirit. But one thing I wanted to pray tonight, that there would be revelation that happens for people. That people would know that they know, this is my calling, this is my purpose, this is even the location where I'm supposed to be. Um, and so one thing I wanted to pray is for, I just want to mention in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to mention the gifts of the Spirit. And then I'm going to just pray that there would be an anointing that would just reveal people's gifts. Um, and then we're going to just do a little bit of ministry time. And it says in 1 Corinthians 12, it says there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So the whole point of our talents and our gifts is to benefit all, is to, to encourage others. One is given the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, to another the gift of faith, to another gifts of healing, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, disturbing, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So He determines who gets the gifts. But we need to be hungry to know what's already ours now. And that's one thing I just wanted to pray, is that the gifts of the Spirit would be ignited in people tonight. And that it would be a reality. Um, that it would be something more real than just the natural, that we would know that we know. Um, you know, I, I was never pursuing the gift of healing. You know, I was going after basketball and like I got my degree in accounting. I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. And then God pursued me with the gift. I never, I never would have asked God, yeah, give me random parts of my body that I feel pain than I ask other people. I never like thought of that, but God thinks of that kind of stuff. And so like he's pursuing us with those gifts and those talents. And he wants it more than we do. And so I just feel like God wants to impart, you know, it's already inside of us, but just to realize what's already ours. And it's been since you were a baby, I mean before, the foundations of the earth. Um, and so one thing I want to do, I'm just going to pray yeah let me pray lord we just thank you you're here we thank you that it's so much more than just a sermon or words we ask for your demonstration of your power tonight hmm. we say words can't save us we need the anointing of holy spirit tonight hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, just put your hand on your heart. And this is not about a show or anything. I'm just, just right where you are, right where you're sitting. Yeah, Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you live inside of us. Whoever is called on the name of the Lord, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we just ask right now that you would reveal to every person their talents, their gifts. 
And I'm just going to, I'm just going to read these out and you might feel the presence of the Lord. You might feel maybe like heat or fire. You might feel nothing at all because we, we receive by faith, but you might just notice something different after this moment. You might start just Holy Spirit speaking to you certain things. And so, Lord, we thank you for the gift of the word of wisdom, that people will be given wisdom for what to do, just like this is what we're supposed to do here. God, we also thank you for the word of knowledge, that there will be specific details that people will be downloaded for other people, that only you would know. We also thank you for the gift of faith here, yeah, God, we call forth the gift of faith right now for people that have it, that never knew they did. God, we also thank you for just the gift of healing for people who you've determined. And uh, Jesus, we thank you for the working of miracles right now, whoever you've appointed to have the working of miracles and a prophecy discerning of spirits and tongues, Lord. So we just thank you that you're the one that gives it. And I actually ask for forgiveness for the body who really maybe talk down about the gifts of the spirit or say, oh, we don't really need it. God, we say it's necessary for your ministry. And God, I just break off that lie that, you're, that people are disqualified from receiving because it's by grace. It's a gift. You can't earn a gift. It's freely given. And so, Father, we thank you for your grace that opens the door to your gifts right now. Yeah. Yeah, I just feel like when people are even going to drive home tonight, there's just going to be, they're going to notice something different. There's going to be like, you're just going to know. There's just an increase. It's like you're doing the same thing, but all of a sudden there's different, there's just results, there's fruit. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, we just seal all this in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I just want to, just a couple words. Um, and I was praying here earlier, and I, I was just, I saw this like vision of, my friend named Caleb, and he, he was wearing a red, I wrote it down, a red flannel, and he had a watch on, and that there was going to be financial blessing coming upon him, and I'm looking around here, and I do see a red flannel here, but your name's not Caleb, but the thing about the prophetic words is you can receive what is for someone else, also for you, and... Um, Caleb also means forerunner. Um, what is your middle name, by the way? Mine? Yeah. Joseph. Okay. I was going to trip out if it was Caleb. So, But Joseph does mean a... Huh? You do have a watch. You do have the red flannel. And that's kind of what I saw. Um, that's cool. But Joseph means abundant provider. And... Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Let me just wait a second. Yeah, Lord, we just, I just thank you for creative ideas. I'm not sure if you thought about like owning a business or anything with like computers or God, we just thank you for creative ideas coming upon your son and that there is a financial blessing coming upon you an anointing to Deuteronomy 818. It's the power of God that gives you wealth and it wouldn't just be for you. It'd be for other people to bless and that you, there would be a need that you would see it. And so, Lord, we just thank you for creative ideas and inventions coming to your son. Even dreams at night that there would just be like, whoa. Yeah, God, we just thank you that promotion does not come from the north or the south. It comes from the Lord. And so, Father, we just call forth this blessing upon your son. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, then I saw this real, it was like right after that, I saw the, the flag of Japan, and I was like, okay, whoa, that was, because I don't get flags too often, but then I felt like it was for, like, I don't know, John or Stephanie, there's something about Japan, 
and maybe you guys have been praying about it. Does that resonate at all like Japan? Okay. What a, say that one more time. For, and then for Japan? Whoa. Cool. Because we were talking before, but I'm glad you didn't say anything. I said, don't talk, because I feel like I have something for you guys. Um, hmm. Wow. I just saw that red, it was like the red circle. And just the blood of Jesus covers you guys there. It's the blood, and there's nothing to worry about. He's already gone ahead of you guys. But I feel like we need to extend our hands to John and Stephanie. God, I thank you for just the anointing on their life, of their family. We just thank you for supernatural protection for them. God, thank you for the angels that just guard them. Yeah, God, we just thank you. We just say any delay, just we just bind up now. We ask there to actually be acceleration and the desires that you've already placed for Stephanie and John, that they would be manifest in this season. And we're seeing this picture of this mountain and think reminded of Cayucas where there's this big flag um, and it's like the, a stake on the mountain. And so, Lord, we thank you for taking that territory for the kingdom of wherever they go, that it's the Lord's. And wherever they, they tread their foot on, it is the Lord's. So, Father, we just thank you for victory in Jesus' name. Amen. And just a couple, um, like for healing, I just was sensing earlier, this is what we need is the demonstration, just like, man, I've been hungry for more, just supernatural, just to really break out, you know? Um, so earlier during the service, I was sitting there and I felt on the right side of my back and then down my right leg, it was like a sciatic nerve that the Lord wanted to heal. And it was like up the back here, and then maybe you feel numb. Is that anyone here? Like something with sciatic or something with the, it like shoots down your leg and then up your back. And you're not in trouble. God loves you. Okay, you're over here. Cool, and that's you? Yeah. What's your name? Elise. Elise. Can we pray for you? Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, Lord, so we just thank you for your healing presence for Elise. God, right now we just command healing of every part of her body, her health, and every area to come into perfect alignment in Jesus' name. Yeah, we just say any sciatic pain or nerve damage just be made whole in Jesus' name. Yeah. Is there is there a way just can you move it around at all or just kind of Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Feels good now? Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Okay, just a couple more. Um, this is just stepping out of the boat. This is fun. So something with the, someone's left ear is maybe like the eardrum or something with left. It's like hearing, but it was like the inner part of it. I don't even know. Is that anyone here? That's you? What exactly is it? Okay. Okay. What was your name? Allie. Okay, Allie. And what was your friend's name? Matt. Can you pray for Allie real quick? Do you want to just pray on the mic? Thank you, Jesus, so much for Allie, God. And we just apply the blood of Jesus in her ear and her throat, God, that this pain has been here for too long, Lord. And she needs her voice right now in this season, God. Because, God, you've given her such an awesome dream, Lord. And, God, you will hear, heal her, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you love Allie so much, God. We just pray for this healing, Lord. You love her so much. You love her so, so much, God. We thank you, Lord. Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, and just, I just saw when you were praying for her, I saw this road map that you were on this adventure and this journey, but I felt like the Lord, like he is the gold, he is the prize, and I just feel like you're going to get what you've been asking for in this season. 
Um, and God is this, there's this greater freedom coming upon you. And I'm seeing like just this release of God's presence. Um, and I feel like there's going to be a fresh adventure coming for you. Like, I'm not sure if you like to travel at all or go places, but I see this passion stirring up of going on like road trips or, or traveling or flying places. Um, Laura, I just thank you for supernatural provision for her. Yeah, I just pray for more than enough. I'm just reminded when um, uh, was Marissa, I, I, we pray, we say, let's, we pray that you would get double of what you need. And she literally got double of what she needed. She needed like 7,000, she got like 14. And so God is the God of more than enough. So God, I pray that she would, she would have way too much. She would have, there would be too much her way. Yeah, because that's your nature. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And um, I do, I feel like to also minister for financial blessing for people, I just want to share this quick testimony I heard today. Um, there was the guy who was on a mission trip, and they needed $1,000 to get to this place. And he said, okay, I want you to count the money how much we have. And they counted, it was only $800. So he goes, no, you count again. And it was $800, and they counted four times. It was still the same amount, because that's how much it was there. He goes, we're going to go to heaven's abundance and heaven's resources, and we're going to pull it down. We're just by faith. And then the fifth time they, they, he counted it, there was $1,000 right there. And so that's the whole point of a miracle. It doesn't make sense in your intellect. If you're thinking, well, I don't know about that. Well, that's the point of a miracle. It doesn't make sense. You can't let, it's not two plus two equals four. Two plus two could equal $10,000 or whatever. And so I want to pray for miracles, not just for provision, but for miracles that you would even look at your bank account and it's like, oh my gosh, this is more than that was there before. Um, but let's see, how should we do this? Thank you, Lord, one second. Yeah, just stand up, actually. Yeah, if, I mean, yeah. And if you don't want this, we need to pray for you after. <laughs> yeah, Lord, we just thank you that we just break off the poverty spirit, that you actually became poor, that we would become rich. Lord, and this is not the prosperity gospel. This is simply what Jesus has done. And it's to bless your children. And it's bless the orphans. And it's to build an orphanage. And to feed the homeless. And to provide shelter for those who need it. And so, Lord, we just break off that lie that you don't want to bless us financially. We break that off now. We don't come into agreement with that anymore or anything. Even of our fathers and mothers or their fathers and mothers, we shut that door now in Jesus' name. And we loose just supernatural provision for everyone standing and the families represented. God, we ask for the anointing that would actually bring wealth. And it wouldn't be just for us, it would be for others. So, Lord, we ask that there would be an increase, that there would even be miracles that people would see that we would even hear testimonies next week of the miraculous provision coming. Yeah, Lord, we just thank you that you're the God of more than enough. Yeah, wow. Thank you, Jesus. In every area, and I just, yeah. We thank you that on earth as it is in heaven, that's your prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. Hmm. Yeah, we sealed this right now in the blood of Jesus. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. I just got like one or two more and then we're going to be done. Thank you for being patient. Um, thank you, Jesus. Wow. You guys doing okay? Okay. <laughs> so, la so when we were praying over there with the team, I was sensing like the right collarbone. I was like, huh, is that for someone? But then in worship, it was like the left one. And I just wanted to ask, I mean, does someone have pain? Like the collarbone area here. Oh, Zane back there? Okay. Broken. Still pain and stuff? I'm glad someone raised their hand because then that would have been a... No, just kidding. <laughs> Tough way to end the meeting. Hey, no one had it. I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> hmm. Yeah, Lord, we just thank you for Zane. We just ask for complete healing and restoration for him. Hmm. And God, we just thank you for the, just the amazing father he is with her new child. And God, we ask that there would be such a, a father's blessing that be upon him from his dad, but also his spiritual father's. And Lord, we just thank you for that, the honor that he walks in. Yeah, Lord, we just thank you for complete healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, I think we're going to be done tonight. Um, if you guys, if anyone else wants prayer for anything, we do want to pray. Um, there is something really powerful about the laying on of hands for impartation for the gifts of God to be realized. If you don't, you know, believe me, I'm just reading the word. And it says, I just got one more verse for you. 1 Timothy 4.14 do not neglect the gift of God that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. And so it just calls it forth. There's just something about impartation that happens that doesn't happen without doing it. You know, so if, if anyone else is hungry for more, we want to simply just take him at his word. You know, there's certain things that happen when you actually grab like the hem of Jesus or you grab hold of him, you know. Um, and so, Lord, we just thank you for tonight. God, we just thank you for sealing everything you, that you did in the spirit. And that people, not one person would walk away empty-handed. That every person would know by your grace what the talents they have and what gifts they have in Jesus' name. I just pray, I just pray that there would be radical divine appointments with people. And that just heal, just all these things. We just want to do the word. So we just take you out your word in Jesus' name. Amen.